He went looking everywhere for a place he could settle his community and he chose Nova Scotia. Our people came here and you know, year by year, they would do the uh, ceremonies and here we are today still. I think our community should know all about the site here and how sacred the whole island, Bodle is not just the, the, the Saint Yan. Hello, I'm Tom Murphy. Welcome to Land and Sea. Cape Breton Island is filled with spectacular landscapes of unforgettable beauty. But there are some places that have something even more. They are felt to be sacred places. Today, we visit two of them that are the spiritual heart of two very different cultures. On the south shore of the Bredore Lake is a small island that's been a sacred gathering place for Mi'kmaq since time immemorial. This is Chapel Island, and it's part of Botledek First Nation. This road here could be the oldest road in Canada. And if it's five to 6,000 years, if you can prove that, this is the oldest road in Canada. So speak, speak to us and, and it sort of gives you the identity that you, our people were here for the longest time, you know, and what they did and the special ceremonies that they have conducted. It's amazing. Joel Denny is a researcher of traditional Mi'kmaq songs and dances. He took part in a study on Chapel Island with the Nova Scotia Museum, and they found signs of human occupation dating back hundreds or even thousands of years in the form of burial mounds. There was uh, an annual burial during the thaw in spring. Mi'kmaq would bring their dead over in canoes and bury them on the island. And because the island has never been developed, burial mounds can still be found here to this day. Well, this is one of the mounds. This 100% mount. And as you see, it's about a good 20 feet round. And it's about maybe this high up from me. And what some of the sites that you, you find, it would be probably two people that are buried in this mount, family members, and sometimes even a dog and their tools. When the dead were brought to the island, a ceremony was conducted before they were buried. But what it consisted of is unknown, and the original site of the ceremony was covered up long ago. Every time they would find a special place or ceremony, they would cover it up or even put a church on top. Jesuit missionaries came to Cape Breton in the early 1600s and they set to work converting the Mi'kmaq to Catholicism. The Jesuits recognized the sacredness of Chapel Island to the Mi'kmaq and over the years, six churches have been built here. Today, the island is best known for the annual St. Anne Mission. How did that happen to our people? We didn't have Catholic religion and stuff like that. We had our own prayers and our own ways. Our people were living within their environment and, and they had a spiritual bond to everything, like animals, birds, fish, you know, plants, medicines, like, you know, everything around us. The Jesuits took time to learn the Mi'kmaq language and understand a bit of their culture. It's no mistake that St. Anne was chosen as the patron saint of the mission. St. Anne was the grandmother of Jesus. And in our, in our culture, that's why we, we give great respect for the grandmother role. Culturally, we practice that. And that's why I think the significance of St. Anne is important to us, because it's related to our culture for respect for the grandparents. The mission on Chapel Island is the longest continuous Catholic mission in Canada. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. And with well, good afternoon, everyone. Joel's sisters, Beverly Jador, Joan Denny, and Wilma Simon, come every year to celebrate. We have a lot of our Mi'kmaq 
family that comes here every year. There's a lot of camping going on, uh, family get-togethers, but there's also prayers. And that's our main focus, is to pray for ourselves, to pray for one another, and to pray for our community. In 1610, Mi'kmaq Grand Chief Member Two was baptized, and Catholic faithful among the Mi'kmaq have been baptizing their children ever since. As parents, is it your will? Every year during the mission on Chapel Island, there is a group baptism for any children born throughout the year. Mi'kmaq people, their faith is very, very unique because we have our faith here already with our, with our surroundings and then our being as a Catholic person interwoven to one another. Mi'kmaq travel from all over Atlantic Canada and the eastern United States to attend the mission here on Chapel Island. Caleb Francis drove with his family for eight hours from Elsie Booktook First Nation in New Brunswick. It's Caleb's first time attending the mission. Across the river there's a whole bunch of kids that I can play with. It's really fun. Caleb has never been to a mass and he doesn't know the history of the burial mounds, but already the island is special to him. Over here, everybody is Indian. And that's what I like. Usually there's only a little bit of Indians where I live, but here, literally everybody's Indian. And it makes me proud to be native. Whether you start counting with the Jesuits or thousands of years pre-contact, Chapel Island is arguably the oldest sacred place in Cape Breton. When Land and Sea returns, we will visit the newest, Gampo Abbey, the only Shambhala Buddhist monastery in the world. On a windswept cliff near the northern tip of Cape Breton Island is a converted burn and a small cluster of buildings. This is Gampo Abbey. The Abbey is the sacred home of the Shambhala monastic order and it was founded in 1983. But the vision for it was born years earlier and a world away in Tibet. So this gentleman up here, his name is Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, and he's the founder not only of this monastery, but of all of the Shambhala tradition around the world. Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche grew up in Tibet, but he had to flee when the communist regime from China invaded in 1950. So we're actually founded by someone who, who walked out of their country, um, fleeing for their life. And he walked out of Tibet, seeing it be destroyed, and didn't say, well, that's it, you know, we're done. He said, people are basically good, and society can also be enlightened. After leaving Tibet, he searched all over for a home for Shambhala, before finally choosing Nova Scotia. It seemed an unlikely choice at the time, but now people from all over the world seek enlightenment at the edge of a cliff in Cape Breton. Just the wind here can make you alone make you go crazy. And it's amazing actually because it has this groundless quality, like it's always blowing and then it's sunny and then there's a rainbow and then it's raining and then there's frost and then so it's like you never, there's nothing you can just kind of rest on in, in that way. And it's just on the edge of a cliff out looking out at the ocean so it's like a totally groundless environment which is great for practice in a way. Taksan Changchup is a professional dancer who came to the Abbey as part of the temporary monastic program in which he and 10 others are fully immersed in monastic life for nine months. It's going really well, sort of surprisingly powerful and in a different way than I expected. Like I think most people or many people who are attracted to monasticism have a definite kind of recluse quality and so people come to the monastery with that kind of idea but actually you're in closer quarters with people 
inside a pressure cooker. So it's actually so intensely about human interaction and how much we all trigger each other. Very intense. I mean, we're so shaped by our environments. And so people come out of whatever environment they've been in, um, which is typically not set up to attain enlightenment. You know? <laughs> and so people come in and they're often kind of, you know, or, you know, think everyone must be perfect. And then, and then gradually see that everyone's a human being and gradually kind of soften up and relax. Loden Nima has been at Gampo Abbey for seven years. He is an ordained monk and a shastri, or teacher, and he works with people who come to the Abbey from all over the world. People like Jigme Yudrin. I was a, a, a felony prosecutor um, in uh, DeKalb County, Georgia, which is part of it, Atlanta, the city of Atlanta, part of the city of Atlanta is in DeKalb County. It's got a lot of crime. After decades of arguing in court, Yudra knew she wanted to do something very different when she retired. Yudrin is not her real name, but while at the Abbey, all monastics receive Tibetan refuge names. Your robe is soaked in water. Your hair I wanted the discipline and the structure of Abbey life. I wanted to experience um, the depth of monasticism and what it would be like to focus on practice as your raison d'etre. Life at the Abbey is highly structured and begins every morning at 6 a.m. with morning chants and meditation. Chants are followed by house chores, and then breakfast. All of this is done in silence, and silence is only broken at lunchtime, after another three hours of meditation and personal practice. Silence begins again at 7.30, and lights out is at 10 p.m. The monastics rarely ever leave the abbey grounds, and while being isolated in rugged Cape Breton has its benefits, they're seldom really alone. It's funny how sometimes the um, blessings are also the challenges. Community life is very challenging. Um, we're together, especially in the winter time. It's hard to believe now when you can go out and about, but in the winter time, you are here. Actually, Ani Pema says it's like we're. Um dirty potatoes in a sack of dirty potatoes that just rub up against each other and kind of rub the dirt off in a kind of inelegant way. That's a surprisingly powerful thing if you don't run away from it, how much people show you yourself and how much it's not about them. And then surprisingly just by listening and staying with that and feeling that, then that opens up to these insane groundless moments that you kind of search for in a deeper solitary retreat. We're here at the edge of the earth doing this very removed thing, but actually I feel like my practice is more integrated into my being with other people more than ever. I'm a crier and it makes me tear up even to say it, but I've kind of learned how to love, you know, in a kind of an, not in a, like a mom, because you know, I'm a mom. And, or a, a, a daughter, or not in a, maybe a conventional sense, but just what it's like to, you know, just to, to live in a, an environment where love is, uh, is happening, you know, and is the way through, so, <laughs> yeah. And to see people from when they come in to when they leave, it's, it's quite something. It's very rewarding for the monastery and, and it's very re rewarding for the people who come. And then that's what we do. You know, we help people soften, we help people become 
discover their own peace, their own confidence, and then go back out with more of that to offer. Gampo Abbey is very secluded as a training ground, but the monastics do have occasional contact with the nearby community of Pleasant Bay. When Land and Sea returns, we'll witness a special ceremony at sea. Today is the last day of lobster season in Cape Breton, which means it is also the day of Gampo Abbey's lobster release, a sacred ritual they carry out every year. There's a long tradition in Buddhism of releasing any living being that would be set to die uh, and releasing it so that it can have its life back. Life releases are carried out all over the world for all different kinds of animals. Lobsters were chosen by Gampo Abbey because of their importance locally. We're not judging the fisher, fisher people, you know, they're making their living, we're not judging that, but since, since those are the beings that we could save from being killed, uh, we purchased the very last catch of the season so they won't be caught again. Captain Mark Timmons sells his last catch to the Abbey every year. I think it's pretty cool. I, I do believe that, uh, you know, good karma, I guess, letting go of those lobsters. Lobsters also molt snakes each year. So you have to change the shell. So this one's got a new shell, shiny. Yeah. This one's been around the block a few times. Well, I think, think uh, too many people have that opportunity that, that I know of. I, I know most fishermen on the last day of the season uh, would much rather uh, enjoy eating their last uh, catch. Some suggest I put a net under the boat and, and recapture them, but that would be a bad karma. Half an hour from port, the monastics reach their destination below the Abbey Cliffs. <laughs> it's okay, we don't need so much. The reason for this is that in the world, nothing is more precious than life itself, and no negative act more serious than taking life. I was kind of worried about the claws, but I don't know, they were sweet. I would take the rubber bands off and they'd just be waiting for me to drop them back in the ocean. You know, it wasn't like they were coming after me or anything, so I felt silly having been worried about them. There's a lot of things after my experience at the Abbey that, about the life that, I, um, that I've led um, that, you know, I'm going to take a look at. This has been a transformative experience being at the Abbey, so that's part of it, yeah. And the main thing in Shambhala is enlightened society, that we want to actually try to contribute not just to our own um, waking up and our own compassion, but to a whole society with everything we're doing here is to try to create more peace and compassion in the world. Community is at the heart of the monastics experience at Gampo Abbey and it is also at the heart of the Mi'kmaq experience on Chapel Island. We, we have love, we have respect with one another, we, have, um, we depend on one another. Church is a community, and that's exactly what, what's happening here. The mission weekend culminates with the procession of St. Anne, and people gather early to get a good view. The procession has been following the same path for centuries, but before it was the processional route of St. Anne, it was the path Mi'kmaq used to carry their dead after bringing them to the island for burial. This is the road here. See the road here? You can see the road coming from here, and it goes up way up here, all the way up to the mountain. We need to bring back our cultural memory, our cultural ways from whoever that were able to save that and, 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 and teach it to our kids. And Bordeladik, here, the Chapel Island, here, we have two roles that are in play here, the traditional old ways 
and the Catholicism that took over and covered that. We ask you to bless this water now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a gathering place for us. It provides cousins and families and friends to get together and just celebrate, you know, the mission. And it's a very important one. Joel Denny doesn't take issue with his sisters or anyone else celebrating the mission, but he wants them to know the whole story. This is a burial mount. That's when our people that bury how they buried their dead long, long time ago. The Indians underneath? There's Indians here and underneath. That's why you can't play around here. Why? Respect them. Mm. You gotta, we got to respect our people. I think our community should know all about this, this site here and how sacred the whole island, Borla is. It's not just the Saint Nyan. Sacred places mean different things to different people. But whatever you believe, their power to attract us and keep us coming back is undeniable. We are richer for having them.